Welcome to Goobertown Hobbies. My name is Brent and I love to print and paint resin models. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how 3D printers work, but I'm going to talk a lot about how resin works. These printers turn liquid resin into solid plastic figures. They print one layer at a time. A motor moves the build plate above an LCD screen and a vat of resin. The resin vat has a clear bottom. UV light from the LCD screen goes through the bottom of the vat and polymerizes a layer of resin on the other side. The screens have a resolution similar to a modern cell phone, so the polymerization is precise and the models come out with really nice detail. Part of what makes these printers so cool is how simple they are. Just one linear actuator and one LCD screen and that's about it. So the technology that's in these bottles is just as amazing. You hit them with a little bit of UV light and they harden up just where you want them to and they stay liquid everywhere else. So how does that work? Okay, the building blocks of polymers are monomers. These are small molecules that have the potential to form chemical chains. Just like building blocks, they have structural features that allow them to connect. If we initiate polymerization, the monomers will start to link up to form dimers and trimers and tetramers and beyond. These short chains are called oligomers. Once the chains get longer, they're called polymers. A single chain can contain hundreds or even thousands of monomer subunits. Nearby chains get tangled with each other, and by now the whole thing is normally a solid. The properties of the solid depend on things like what monomer you started with, and what the average chain length is. Something else to know about polymers is that they can contain multiple ingredients. Most of these liquid resins use a proprietary blend of different chemicals. Us folks who 3D print as a hobby are always comparing notes about different resins. You know, which ones are hard or soft or brittle or hold detail really well. And in broad strokes, it's the same thing going on in all these bottles. It's all acrylate chemistry, acrylate polymerization. But in the details, there are actually a lot of differences between these different blends and that's what we're gonna talk about. It is perfectly reasonable to mix two or more different monomers together. When this mixture polymerizes, we'll end up with a copolymer that'll have different properties from what we'd get from either of the monomers alone. These copolymer chains won't always have a nice alternating pattern between monomer A and monomer B. Sometimes you'll get a whole bunch of one type in a row, and sometimes a whole bunch of the other. So this is one place where the building block analogy of polymers is misleading. With something like Lego bricks, we can determine where each piece goes really precisely, but with chemicals, they are so small that as humans on our size scale, all we can do is decide which chemicals to mix together and whether or not to heat them and whether or not to shine UV light at them. Everything else is up to physics and chemistry and statistics. For the type of polymerization reaction that we're talking about today, the ingredients don't get placed precisely into polymer chains. But as long as you shake the bottle of resin really well before you use it, statistics will make sure that the properties of the solid are nice and reliable. So far we've been talking about this reaction with these cutesy little cartoons with the stylized ball and socket joints. Now obviously this is an exaggeration, but for somebody with a trained eye, we absolutely can look at a molecule and see connection points, places where new bonds can be made. This here is methyl methacrylate. It is the monomer in plexiglass, and this acrylate group is really important to the chemistry of these resins. So to my eye, these two carbons over here are really important. I look at this and I see connection points. You know, in uh, in the cutesy terms, I see a ball and a socket, places where we can bind more monomers to this one. So this is methyl methacrylate, it's a monomer. But we can also have larger molecules that have that acrylate group. So in this mo molecule, we have an acrylate group over here and one over here. And so that means this molecule has two different places where we can be making connections. So ball and socket here, ball and socket here. And that means this molecule can be involved in two polymer chains at the same time. This is something known as a crosslinker. Let's get back to the cartoons and talk about crosslinkers. 
Some larger molecules have multiple connection points. If we mix them in with some monomers, we can link the chains together. This changes the macroscopic qualities of the polymer. Often, cross-linked polymers are more rigid and more durable. I've been using this little ball and socket drawing as a cute way to depict acrylates and polyacrylates. Of course, there are lots of other polymers out there. Polyamides, polycarbonates, polyvinyls. The biggest difference between these families is the type of bond that links the monomer units into the polymer chains. In cute picture format, instead of a round peg in a round hole, maybe we've got square pegs and square holes, or maybe triangles. Sure. For 3D printer resin, it's still the acrylate chemistry that's the most important. But when we look at the ingredient list for some of these commercially available resins, we'll see words like polyurethane acrylate. In cartoon form, here's a chain of polyurethane. Urethane monomers bound together into a polymer. Chemical engineers and synthetic chemists can stick acrylate groups onto the ends of this polymer. This is polyurethane acrylate, and for our purposes, it's just a big ol' crosslinker. The term resin is a bit vague. Generally, it's a liquid that can be hardened into a solid polymer, so everything in our bottles of printer juice is resin, but a narrower definition is pretty much what we're looking at here. A thick liquid of short polymer chains that can be hardened into a cross-linked solid. What we're looking at here is a big cross-linker and a stereotypical resin. We are almost ready to understand the ingredient list for what's going on in these printer resins. So we've talked about monomers and cross-linkers. Also in these bottles can be uh, pigments or dyes. These are often colored. Not always, but often. Also in here we can have straight up filler. And by that I mean molecules that don't end up directly bound into the polymer. They sit in between uh, the polymer chains in the final solid matrix. They still play a role, but they're not directly bound in. And uh, these you know, filler molecules also can play a role in keeping the resin nice and viscous during the printing process. Some of these fillers are known as plasticizers. They give some plasticity to the solid and keep it from becoming too brittle. Last but certainly not least, every one of these bottles needs to contain some photoinitiator. This is the stuff that absorbs UV light from the printer and uses that energy to start the polymerization reaction. Here's a little cheat sheet for the things that could be in these bottles of resin. Monomers, the basic building blocks of polymers. Crosslinkers, molecules that can join two or more polymer chains together. Plasticizers, other stuff that gets tangled into the polymer matrix. Photoinitiators to get the reaction going. Pigments to make the models we print look cool. The manufacturers of these resins are required to put out safety information in the form of safety data sheets. Now, for trade secret reasons, they try to be a little bit vague about the ingredient list, but if we know what we're looking for, we can figure out what's going on. Here's one from Form Labs White Resin. They list methacrylated oligomer, methacrylated monomer, and a third ingredient which is a photoinitiator. You can see that they're coy with the exact percentages and even the precise identity of some of the ingredients, but they give you enough information to gauge the risks of working with this stuff. We'll talk about safety in a moment, but for now, I look at this list and I see crosslinker, monomer, and initiator. Here's one from Elegoo. Epoxy acrylate resin, monomer, color pigment, and photoinitiators. Again, the main ingredient is a large crosslinker type resin followed by monomer and then pigment and photoinitiator. Here's another one. Acrylate monomer, polyurethane acrylate, and photoinitiator. On to any cubic white resin. Polyurethane acrylate, acrylate monomer, photoinitiator. For fun, here's one from Global 3D. They list five different acrylate monomers, each somewhere between 0 and 40%. And they list two acrylate crosslinking resins, somewhere between 10 and 50% each. I just thought this one was fun because of how vague those percentages were. Some companies really guard their trade secrets. Alright, 
I think we've got the general idea of the type of stuff that goes into these resins, so now let's focus in on just one of these. This is Anycubic Eco Resin. It is a resin I've used a fair bit before, and I like it. But more importantly, on the SDS sheet, they actually list all the chemicals that are in there and their exact percentages, so that is very handy. We've got epoxidized butyl esters of fatty acids derived from soybeans, 45%. Isooctyl acrylate, 30%. Very long name that ends in acrylate, 15%. Two other molecules at 5% each. So that's five listed ingredients, and the percentages add up to 100%. This is a good start. The sheet doesn't spell out the role of each chemical, though. So the fun part is figuring out what each of these does. Here are the structures. Let's see what we can see. First, I see some acrylate groups. Isooctyl acrylate is a monomer. If I drew it as a cartoon, the ball and socket would be here where the acrylate is, and it would have a big side group where the isooctyl is. This bigger molecule has four acrylate groups. This is definitely a crosslinker, and in theory, it could be a link in four different polymer chains at the same time. Next, polychlorocopper thalocyanine. This big ring compound has actually appeared on this channel before. It's one of my favorite materials that I use in this hobby. Do you recognize it? This is green pigment number seven. Green pigment number seven, thalo green. In a previous hobby science video, I talked about common pigments, and thalo green is a big one. The stuff that makes a lot of our paints and inks green is the same molecule that makes this model of Baby Yoda green. You know, I love doing these hobby science videos because every time we learn new things, some of those things start to connect and the world makes a little more sense, and that's a beautiful thing. Back to the list of ingredients. 45% of the material in this mixture is derived from soy oil. That's a filler and a plasticizer, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then we have this molecule, weighing in at 5% of the mix. This is the photoinitiator. This is the molecule that absorbs UV radiation from the printer and initiates polymerization. Okay, it's time to talk about how this reaction actually works. Now, in a liquid, Molecules are constantly floating around and bouncing off of each other. Now, most of the time when molecules collide, nothing happens. But if two molecules collide at just the right angle and there's enough energy involved, it is possible for a chemical reaction to occur. Now, for the reaction that's going on in 3D printing, you don't have to be a chemist to understand it. We can think about this polymerization through the lens of even and odd numbers. Okay, check this out. All organic molecules have an even number of electrons. At some point, you've probably heard about electron pairs and valence electron shells and something about atoms want to have full electron shells. Well, all of that kind of boils down to the fact that all stable organic molecules have an even number of electrons. So, everything in this bottle, all of the molecules in this bottle, have an even number of electrons. And for the most part, those are not too reactive. But, if we were to have a species that had an odd number of electrons, those are called radicals, those are unstable and reactive, and indeed, that's going to be what happens in this reaction. So in this reaction, when we hit the photo initiator with light, we're going to generate radicals that have odd number of electrons and start reacting with molecules that have even number of electrons. Back to the cartoons for a moment. Here's the initiator molecule. Sometimes when it absorbs UV radiation, it fragments. Photons of ultraviolet light have more energy than visible light. Normally, visible light can't start chemical reactions but sometimes UV light can. That's why us humans need to be careful with UV light to avoid sunburns and cancer and all that. The photo initiator starts as a molecule with an even number of electrons, and it fragments into two radicals, each with an odd number of electrons. 
These radicals are highly reactive, and they really get the polymerization going. So now there's a small percentage of radicals floating around in our liquid resin, and they're bumping into things just like all the molecules are, but when radicals collide with something, they're more reactive and so there's a higher chance of a chemical reaction occurring. Now statistically, they are most likely to collide with a molecule, so we have a situation where a radical is colliding with a molecule. Now here's the key bit. When an odd number is added to an even number, the result is an odd number. So if a reaction occurs between a radical and a molecule, the product is going to be another radical, which is still reactive. So the initiator fragments and the fragments are radicals. When the radical collides with a monomer or crosslinker, the two can bind together. But the product of the reaction is still a radical. It's still highly reactive. The radical keeps floating around in solution and colliding with things. And when it collides with monomers or crosslinkers at just the right angle, a reaction can occur. Odd plus even yields odd, so we keep getting a larger and larger radical. This chain reaction is called radical chain polymerization. Now eventually a radical will collide with another radical. Odd plus odd yields even, and that reaction will give a stable product. Since we know the ingredients of the AnyCubic Eco Resin, I'll show you what's going on with a real example. The initiator molecule here starts with 188 electrons, even number. Covalent chemical bonds are the sharing of a pair of electrons. UV light can cause a cleavage of this carbon-carbon bond that leaves one of the two bonding electrons with the big fragment and one with the smaller fragment. There's a lot of carbon-carbon bonds in the resin mix, but the reason that this photolytic cleavage can occur is that these radicals are just stable enough to get formed. That being said, these fragments are still quite reactive. So when this radical collides with an acrylate group, a reaction can occur. These arrows show the movement of electrons during a reaction. That unpaired electron on the radical and one electron from that double bond in the acrylate group get together to form a new carbon-carbon single bond that links the radical to the monomer. But it also leaves behind a new unpaired electron. Our product is still a radical, and it's still reactive. The chain reaction has begun. Monomer or crosslinker units keep getting added to the chain, and that unpaired electron stays around. Once you get these chain reactions started, they really go on their own for a little while. Polymer chains often end up being hundreds or thousands of units long. A reasonable question is why doesn't the chain reaction cause the whole vat of resin to turn into a solid chunk? Well, molecules are really small. A monomer is, very roughly, one nanometer long. When the LCD screen on the printer lights up a pixel of UV light, that pixel is a little square approximately 50,000 nanometers long. So it's possible for the chain reaction to propagate outside the lit region a little bit, but it won't get far enough for us to actually notice. It's actually more likely for the UV light itself to leak outside of its designated square, and that's why sometimes clear resins give different prints from solid color resins. So the specific resin that we've been doing a deeper dive on is this AnyCubic Eco Resin. Now this stuff is sold as being um, sourced from nature and biodegradable and a little bit safer. So let's talk about those claims a little bit. Uh, before we go any further, I do like this stuff, I do use it, but yeah, let's talk about those claims a little bit. This is the marketing that AnyCubic has been using. Soybeans processed into resin, then back to nature. The marketing on this looks good, and from personal experience, it definitely does have less of a chemical smell than other resins that I've used. This is the ingredient list. Processed soybean oil, monomer, crosslinker, pigment, and photoinitiator. Okay, so that 45% ingredient does come from soy. One way you can tell is because soya is in the title, but also there's a really big clue in the fact that some of the other words are pluralized. Butyl esters, fatty acids. Now, in soy, the plant and the bean, there are thousands of different molecules. 
And if you squeeze a soybean to get the oil out, that oil is still going to be a blend of a whole bunch of different stuff. So not isolated individual molecules that you can give a singular name to, but you know, a blend of different fatty acids, for example. That's not a bad thing. That blend can absolutely be useful to us. And it's also kind of a hint that this ingredient is not too many steps away from actually coming from a plant, which is cool and is as advertised. So this ingredient is soybean oil that's had a couple of chemical modifications to it. Fats in plants and animals often exist as triglycerides. The three ester linkages over here are an easy place to make chemical modifications. For example, if you treat fat with lye, like in Fight Club, you can cleave the ester and make these long chain carboxylates with a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. Missable with grease and missable with water. Soap. Just like Fight Club. The neutral protonated form of this is called a fatty acid. If the carbon chain has no double bonds, that means the molecule is saturated with hydrogen atoms and it's called a saturated fatty acid. If the carbon chain does have carbon-carbon double bonds, it's an unsaturated fatty acid. This soy oil has lots of unsaturated fatty acids. Depending on what decade you live in, this is called the good fat. Now the SDS sheet says that our bottle contains butyl esters. There we go. Again, that side of the molecule is easy to modify. As part of the processing, it seems like they converted triglycerides or fatty acids into butyl esters. Presumably the viscosity of the butyl esters works well here. Another modification is epoxidation. If this molecule is hit with an oxidizer, the carbon-carbon double bonds will get converted into epoxides. The ingredient list says that the resin contains 45% fatty acids, soya, epoxidized butyl esters. So I read that as a bunch of structurally related molecules similar to this. Epoxidized soybean oils are becoming more and more common as plasticizers. In the final polymer, it's filler, but it's filler that keeps the plastic from being too brittle. This stuff is probably also useful in the liquid resin to keep everything in the blend suspended as a liquid mixture with the right viscosity. Okay, what about the other ingredients? I don't know for sure where they sourced each of these, but I don't think they came from soybeans. The fact that each of these is reported as a pure single compound and not as a blend or an extract is a big hint that they've been on a long journey since the last time that they were part of nature. I'm sure that all of this material was part of a plant at some point, but that may have been millions of years ago, and they may have spent time as a petroleum product in the meantime. Okay, so 45% of this stuff does come from soybean oil after a couple rounds of chemical modification. Now, the other 55%, I don't know for sure, but it is very similar to the stuff that's in all the other brands of resin. I think it's much more likely that that other 55% came from petroleum products, but you know, that being said, I think it's awesome that nearly half of this came from natural, renewable sources. That's great. And uh, it does have less of an odor than other resins have, so that's great too. That being said, the marketing is a little bit misleading. There's, there's images of people composting this, and it's somehow turning back into drinking water. And I'll just say, do not spread this on your garden. Um, and that image of it, you know, decomposing into drinking water is just wildly irresponsible. But yeah, there you go. I think it's cool that, you know, half of this did not need to be sourced from petroleum products. That's great. Okay, this brings us to safety. We've spent some time looking through safety data sheets, and most of them say that this can be a skin irritant and a respiratory irritant. It's also poisonous if you drink it, and it's poisonous to wildlife if you pour it down the drain. That being said, there are lots of differences between the precise ingredients used between different brands and different companies, so be sure to read up on the one that you're using. If a Google search doesn't get you an SDS sheet, you should be able to email the company and get them to send you a PDF of that safety sheet. The safety hazards for chemicals are classified as 1, 2, 3, or 4. 1 is pretty tame, be careful with 2, be very careful with 3, 
and 4. You really shouldn't have in your home unless you have a very compelling reason. Most of the hazards in resins are 1s and 2s, with drinking it being a 4. Don't drink resin. Okay, chemical safety. I am a chemist. I've spent many years working in laboratories. I've worked with truly frightening things and tame things and everywhere in between. And in some ways, I guess that makes me not a great person to talk to because I've been sensitized to some risks and desensitized to others. But I think the real take home message here is that uh, low risk, it never means no risk. You should treat all chemicals with respect. Um, as for the stuff in these bottles, even as a chemist, even as a person who's read the SDS sheets, I do not fully understand all of the risks that are in this bottle. Nothing in here truly scares me, but I do treat it with respect, you know? Um, I always wear gloves when I work with this stuff, first because it's icky, but also uh, it can cause uh, skin irritation or even allergic reactions. Um, it is a good idea to wear eye protection. Um, certainly do not put this in a place where a child or a pet could ingest it. And also, um, I try to breathe the fumes as little as possible, so I don't spend a lot of time in a room while a printer is actively working. Now, uh, another safety thing to talk about is ethanol or isopropanol. So most people, when they're cleaning their prints or just cleaning up around their work area, um, those alcohols work very well as cleaning solvents, but of course, uh, just a reminder, alcohols, the liquid and the fumes are very, very flammable, so be careful with them. Do not burn down your house and do not burn down your neighbor's house. Um, other than that, we don't need to be afraid of this stuff, but do treat it with respect. That's my, that's my advice. And now we can talk about disposal. The correct answer is that you should contact your local waste management department and follow their instructions. Okay, now let me tell you what I actually do. Now, the solid is really quite safe and is fine to throw right in the trash. As for the liquid, um, a couple of things. One, it is very easy to turn the liquid into a solid, and two, um, the liquid is expensive. You shouldn't be throwing away that much of it anyway. So if you are done with your printer for a while, you absolutely save the resin, pour it back through the filter that came with the printer into the bottle, seal up the bottle, use it next time. Um, if you have a, a paper towel with a, you know resin soaked into it, um, the best thing you can do is leave that out in the sun for a couple hours, that resin will polymerize, and that solid waste is really fine to go right into the landfill. And uh, if it's not sunny out, just Throw it in a bag, and uh, that's probably fine to go in the landfill as well. Now, the most interesting waste that I generate, or maybe the most tricky, is the vat of alcohol that's kind of gotten resin mixed up in it from, from rinsing off prints. Now, that's you know kind of a, a lot of volume of alcohol that gets all nasty with the resin, and so it's a little bit of a question of how to dispose of that properly. So. A couple of suggestions there. One, if you let that mixture settle out for a couple of weeks, normally all the resin will soak to the bottom or sink to the bottom, and then you can decant off the alcohol and use that again. Um, another possibility is if you are really done with that jar of liquid, is to let the alcohol evaporate and then deal with the sludge at the bottom after that's happened. So. In terms of alcohol evaporating, um, again, be careful that you're not going to burn down your house, do that in an open area, what have you. But um, don't feel bad about evaporating alcohol. Um, it happens at hospitals and bars all the time, you know, for isopropanol and ethanol. So really don't worry about that. And uh, for the most part, you won't be losing too much of the resin stuff to the atmosphere. Don't worry about that either. Um, and then once you have kind of a sludge at the bottom of, of your container, you can um, either hit that with light and polymerize it or wipe it up, uh, get it onto a paper towel, throw it in a couple of bags, solid waste, throw it right in the, uh, in the landfill. So that's, uh, that's waste disposal. Uh, again, the, the take home message is that the solid is really not that harmful, can go right in the trash and the liquid, very easy to turn the liquid into a solid. So there you go. Um, don't pour it down the drain. 
Right, that's that's the other thing. None of the liquid should ever go down the drain. Not the alcohol, not the alcohol soaked in resin. Never down the drain. In the scheme of things, we're generating small quantities of waste. Between evaporation and disposing of the remaining solids in the landfill, my conscience is clear. All right, I think we're wrapping up here. I was planning on this being a quick episode. Uh, it wasn't, but it was fun. You know, these episodes where we actually learn something are really gratifying to me, and uh, it's awesome how kind of the abstract chemistry comes together with practical considerations. And if nothing else, I hope I've convinced you to shake your bottles of resin really well so that the monomers and the crosslinkers and the initiators are all mixed in together the way they're supposed to be. So, yeah. That's it for this time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Shake your resin, and uh, thank you so much for watching.